surface of the earth this is the surface of the earth then we have all this to be measured so we have the troposphere layer then the stratosphere layer and the meso mesosphere layer then ionosphere then solar system sun so all these are examples of your targets targeting the terrestrial environment <clears throat> now let us see the origin of remote sensing how this remote sensing came so the origin of remote sensing began with the aerial photography okay. so what is this aerial photography so let us see what is this so the first photographs were taken in 1839 so he is the cameraman then this is the photo that he had taken which is black and white picture but then 1858 Jasper Felix Tornoch took nadar photograph of the village petit bitting in france from a balloon you can see the balloon structure which is flying in sky and uh, going into this balloon he had taken the photographs which was portrait so this was the this was the first village to be photographed from a balloon so this is what he had taken so he had taken the photograph of paris and he had labeled it like this paris by nada circa 1859 you can see black and white picture you can see roads so avenue b o b o c d bangalore r t formally parmi monastery are the street names so he had labeled it after so these are the buildings which are already present so these what do you call the greenish like structures which we see in color it is greenish so those are trees or forests or plantations so then the history of aerial photography started during the united states civil war so where union general george mcclen photographs confederate troop positions in virginia so he had uh, used pigeons you can see at the right hand side you have pigeons are taking photographs in 1882 ed arichpald british meteorologist takes first kite photograph the thing is he, he had uh, deployed a camera with the pigeon and he sent it for taking photographs so in 1903 pigeon cameras came then in 1906 george lawrence photographs San Francisco. in 1903 uh, cameras were uh, fixed to pigeons they flew away throughout the place they took photographs and that was being recorded kite photographs then in uh, san francisco during uh, 1906 there was a earthquake and fire so which was photographed by using the same technique it is a history of aerial photography by george lawrence he yeah, took photographs of that so this is how a pigeon taking a photograph then in the balloon this is in 1960 sorry uh, 1860 boston by black and king took a photograph of a town 
how your town is looking from aerial. You can see apartments, you can see buildings, you can see how they are being structured. Then during the World War One, which paved way for uh, major development of aerial photography was taking photographs using aircraft. So you can see a pilot, a photographer, pilot in the front, a photographer at the back, adjusting his camera or fitting his camera to the aircraft out such that they can take photography of the enemy territory that they move on. So after the war, the technology was in place to begin large scale aerial surveys. You can see a pilot again, pilot and a photographer who is being deployed in the aircraft for taking photographs from space or from atmosphere, either in troposphere to monitor their enemy, the enemy territories. And most probably everyone are familiar with the World War One, World War Two. What had happened in the European Union? What had happened in the American? What had happened with the Japanese, with the Germanists, French, and so on? So, I think most of you all are familiar with the history. So, this would be an interesting photograph for you, where enemy territory were monitored by using aerial surveys in those days. So then came the air photography or we call it as aerial photography or aircraft photography. So a bird's eye view is very useful for map making. The futures obscure each other less when viewed from above than when viewed from ground level. So whenever we view from a ground level, the futures will be very large and when we see from a top level or when we view from an uh, top view of the ground or of the surface, it will be looking very less. Okay, The thing is that keeping the objects nearer looks very much larger, whereas keeping the objects very much farer looks very small. So this air photography came from many sources. So as you had seen, uh, the examples airplanes of all types equipped with cameras, aircrafts, uh, then uh, hot air balloons, which was done, helicopters, pigeons, etc., were being used for air photography. From there, the aerial photography or the air photography came into existence. So, we will discuss uh, about the film cameras, but most of the same concepts apply to digital cameras also. Okay. What are the camera technology is out of our syllabus. So we need not discuss about that. So this is the basic terminology about the film cameras. We have a focal length, distance between the camera lens and the flame, the flying height, the height of the plane above the ground plane, the nadir, the point on the ground directly below the camera camera is the nadir point. Flight line, the path of the airplane over which a sequence of pictures is taken is flight line. Stereoscope is a device used to view or measure future heights or landscape elevations using pairs of air photographs. Then we have uh, fiducial marks. So marks on photographs used to align adjust photographs for stereoscopic analysis is fiducial marks. So then let us see how this air photo scale is being done because we may be uh, uh, moving at uh, 1000 kilometers or 500 kilometers or 50 meters or 500 meters from the earth surface. So how do I rationalize it? So this rationalizing can be done by a photo scale. In what distance we are flying and uh, what is the focal length? So that should be measured. 
so the ratio is one is to focal length or flying height depending upon that we can find its scale rf so example for example we have a focal length uh, six inches and flying height of 10,000 feet for example consider we are measuring like this so the scale is 0 0.5 0 0.5 divided by 10,000 which is 1 is to 20,000 so this is your scale factor in our photo scale next diagram is the basic uh, basic camera you can see camera is used for taking photographs aerially so i had given you an example of basic camera how it works so we have uh, four points a b d e so at the top d e is the plane of flint plane and uh, the cameras use converging so de plane is merged with the ab plane so where ab is the terrain on the ground or on the surface of the earth where we want to measure or where we want to take photograph or we want to take image of that so c is the point c is the point which coincides both and that point we want to find it okay so from that point c to the flint plane is f and uh, the terrain plane or from the c point to the terrain or the earth surface is h so f is your focal length h is your elevation above ground so by this the scale factor is obtained rf So this will give you how this is being calculated scale. Basic camera principle. You can see if the focus length is f bar four, film exposure, film exposure f bar four. This is your resolution. It can cover larger diameter. If the f bar five point six ratio. This is your resolution. How much? This much amount of area can be covered so f bar 8 this much area can be covered f bar 11 this much area can be covered f bar 16 only this much f bar 22 this much area but with higher resolution okay so this is done by f stop or relative aperture f which is an effective lens diameter which was used in the basic camera okay so the film exposure the quantity of energy that is allowed to reach the film how much energy we want to reach into the flame that is being focused so controlled by a relative f-stop and shutter speed which is used for which is used as an energy source so flame basics so there are four different types of flame basics one is the black and white other is called as panchromatic second one color third one infrared fourth one color infrared so depending upon the application or service needed these are being chosen and with respect to time so as the time proceeded from evolution from first world war till today or from uh, 19th century to till today this were being used at different time periods you can see first I'll, uh, give you the primary colors so primary colors are three red green and blue so on a combination of all these three we get some colors so in a proportion when we combine this red green and blue in a proportion we get white color Okay, when we combine only red and green, we get yellow. You can see here, red and green, when we combine, we'll get yellow color. When we combine green and blue, 
we get cyan color and we combine red and blue we get magenta okay so this is additive coloring addition okay and here when we do subtraction so from black when we separate some types of color the other color will be obtained so this is your subtractive color so this is a basic color theory three color theory we call it as so when you separate yellow we get red and blue and when we separate from black magenta we get the other two colors and we separate all the others we get the remaining magenta okay so this is how subtractive color theory is three color theory we call in short in color television system so flame next is the flame and electromagnetic spectrum how this electromagnetic spectrum is used for flaming okay what are the spectrums or what are the values being used so this pan chromatic flame which is your black and white is used in 250 nanometer to 680 nanometer you can see pan chromatic flame so which comes under ultraviolet to visible light somewhere here in yellow sorry orange so then the extended red sensitive pan chromatic flames were extended from uh, is used from 250 nanometer to 700 nanometer then from 250 nanometer to 900 nanometer we use infrared flames the infrared region then the regions from 250 nanometer to 1200 nanometer use extreme infrared sensitive materials so this region so which comes under your uh, ultraviolet region visible light near infrared and far infrared region which covers maximum all this and uh, from 250 nanometer to 300 nanometer there is a limitation of glasses you can see limitation of glasses limit of transmission of glass and uh, beyond the ultraviolet rays beyond the uv rays we cannot go because there is limitation of transmission by gelatin so this is how the flaming wavelengths are being chosen depending upon the sensitivity ness that we want to measure or depending upon the application or service needed we choose whether to be it as ir extreme ir extended red sensitive or pan chromatic flames so next i'll show you an example of a location taken in color photograph and in uh, color infrared photograph near burlington in vt okay you can see the images see the left side image is a color photograph taken when color photograph is taken it looks like this you can see some type of uh, guards are there some bushes are there like that in this region in color photograph whereas when you see the color infrared photograph you can see same area is taken in color infrared cir frames so when you see cir frames you can see that there is a more enhancement from color to color infrared we can see exactly we can locate that this is a boundary there is a path here and here there is a path here there is a small building okay so depending upon need and resolution we can use which photograph you want to choose so next is resolution currently the resolution is uh, taken by a 9 cross 9 inch format digital camera is used which is requiring about 400 million pixels to obtain a 9 cross 9 inch film camera which was done by peeny and kaiser in 2003 so roughly roughly the pixel value is 2222 pixels per inch 
so which are elements value was taken for consideration here so till this resolution any queries if you have put in type chat box then i'll proceed for the next topic if you have any queries till this uh, resolutions you can type in chat box i'll give you some 5 minutes time if you have any queries type in chat box then i'll proceed on to the next topic okay which is a sub topic of this aerial photography itself okay thank you sai ganesh so this uh, subject is more uh, relativistic so whatever we measure or whatever we do has to be shown in a uh, photograph only rather than uh, textuals that's what i had uh, <coughs> found out brought some uh, images that are relevant to your subject and i am showing it in an ppt so since there are no queries i move further on to the flight lines okay you can see that in this diagram this diagram which is divided into some imaginary lines so actually these are these spots okay so this dots this dots which are being pointed are spots which are if you see that they would be everything present in a single line you can see that they are in a parallel lines so this dots in series of arrays are parallel to this series of arrays then this series of arrays this series of arrays this series of arrays so what is this is that on papers the village dodge wheels 
in france was taken so how the flights tends to move from one point to another point was being drawn okay so those are the points where they went you can see that 26 is being marked circled 28 is encircled here you can see 26 ns encircle the 28 encircle so these are the ports or these are the aerodromes or the launch and pick up either could be landing or either could be pick uping points so from here to here a flight is traveling so in that flight when it moved it had taken photograph here it had taken photograph here so this is way so successive photos on a flight line typically having approximately 60 to 65 percentage overlapping to allow stereoscopic viewing was taken some location on the ground may be imagined on a three photographs along the same flight and six photographs were taken it depends upon it are dependent upon the service that they required okay so these lines which are drawn you can see that these lines so this is the line which was taken by a plane it traveled in this direction another plane traveled in this direction another plane traveled in this direction so another plane traveled in this direction and they took photographs and gave information so this is an example of stereoscopic parallax you can see this stereoscopic parallax is caused by shift in the position of observation where parallax is directly related to the elevation or height of the features so when aircraft is traveling it will take photographs of the particular place okay so wherever we get a 60 percentage of overlapping in a better way that will be taken you can see that flight at this distant point is taken a photograph of this uh, land or this ocean or this geographical area so in the second instant it had moved some distance then it had taken and which is finalized is that the center where 60 percentage is being overlapped where we get the exact resemblance is taken for photographic and developing so you can see that strip 1 moves on to strip 2 then the side overlap and whatever is being overlapped in the first frame and the second frame is taken as your finalized this is how to take the exact geographical area this is example of an air photo mosaic you can see the image maps so this is this darker region which is present here is your water water body this is your land which is divided taken from a taken from a aerial photograph developed and printed on a paper you can see that there is the movement of like this like a snaky like structures so this is a river which is goes It is going. It is going. It is going. Here is a river. It is going. Shape structures. So this is your stereo pair. So this was taken in ten. You can see that thirty first October nineteen seventy eight. You can see stereo pictures. St stereo pair taken like this. So photo of the In the first photo, in the second, you can see that difference is this photograph is taken with the serial number three six zero two nine one seventy six one eighty nine, and in series next photograph, but give a better resolution. So this is what is your stereoscopic parallax is, and they are printed it on paper. Okay, date, time, and the serial number. which gives you illustration of there is a street here this is a street i'm showing an arrow this is a street which ends up here this is a building this is a building this is a building this is a building this is how the stereoscope looks like for photography 
okay two different camera lenses then next is your aligning air photos which comes in your fiducial marks so the type and number of vary amongst cameras should be positioned in four different corners such that four to eight marks will be marked like a top bottom left right and four corners all the four corners and the top left top bottom left right are being positioned for better fiducial marks so the exact point at which the camera was aimed when the photo was acquired is called as the principal point and the principal point of an adjacent photograph in the first flight is called as the conjugate principal point so you can see that example photo 1 photo 1 you can see the left left side photo 1 the fiducial mark is here the line of flight is here so the principal point of photo 1 pp1 is pointed here so then in the next photograph photo 2 this pointed here then photo 1 photo 2 comes then principal point of photo 1 equals to the conjugate principal point of photo 2 so this point then the line of light occurs here so where we get 60% of overlapping so that becomes your stereoscoping model and that is developed and printed are kept for references so next up is distortion so we have developed all these things we had used in taking photographs what are the distortions that we that they faced or what are the obstructions that they faced in taking photographs or in uh, developing or in manipulating it okay let us see that so from collection point of view what were the difficulties in source of distortion is yarn yarn is plain fuselage which is not parallel to flight light so just think about uh, having a steer in your car slightly with a strong crosswind the thing is that when taking photographs from flight we put our uh, cameras or we put our uh, telescopes or stereoscopes towards the earth so due to the flight movement they will not be parallel so that will lead to pictures not being square with the flight line okay that we called as yarn why next is the pitch the nose or tail higher than the other leads to principal point not being at that end the thing is that we will be pointing at a, some building or will be pointing at a uh, particular animal which is moving in forest we point to that and we take photographs so due to this pitch p rather than at the nadir point it will move to the some other points due to the flight amount of the flight we aim at a particular point and it will not be placing at a particular point okay which is p pitch next is the roll one wing higher than the other so there in pitch we had no sort tail higher than the other where here we have one wing higher than the other so this also will lead to principal point not being at nadir point okay so these are the sources of distortion from collection point of view so whereas from natural point of view the topographical changes like for example uh, if flying over mountains okay the height above the ground will change from picture to picture and all the mountains will not be in a uniform so the picture taken will not be taken in a uniform picture wise because both of this will lead to irregularities in photoscape so when you fly over a mountain at the mountain is height about uh, uh, 50 meters 
we will take photographs from a 5 meter or 10 meter or a 15 meter and so on we'll take photographs so when we scale it on we should appropriately mention or we should appropriately make a note at which height of the above the ground well we are taken that point so that is to be kept in mind so this leads to photo scaling irregularities so next there are types of aerial photographs so one is vertical you can see the place the camera is flying in a helicopter or an aircraft or an pigeon if it is taking vertically you can see how this location looks so next here when an uh, same pigeon or aircraft or helicopter is flying if a photograph is taken in low oblique you can see this is vertical this is low oblique this will look like this the picture will look like this when the same is taken it will look like this this is a high oblique I'll show you on the building vertical it is exactly top exactly top measurement vertical measurement then low oblique at an angle and this is at an high oblique you can see we can cover a larger area in high oblique so these are the types of aerial photographs so depending upon the need we can choose which one we want so then types of aerial photograph so vertical is the most important as it has minimum distortion and can be used for taking measurements you can see the focal length the camera which is being focused at the top we have the land area a b c d land area so we'll be using taking our photo from there the point of convergence c you can see at the center optical lens we measure the height and we can find okay vertical so most probably vertical type of aerial photograph is recommended for better measurements so you can see the fiducial marks so this is a photograph this photograph taken uh, within uh, latitude of 20, 296 east you can see there are some points in the in the axis you can see that the corners are being fixed and uh, each and every Each and every corners are being fixed, and we have uh, between one corner to another corner a center point, which is a mark we call it as fiducial marks. And the line joining with them is your fiducial axis. So the exact center can be located now by marking the center of a fiducial axis. Okay, so that point you can see that. The fiducial axis joins at point, so that point is your principal point, and the shifting is your marginal information that can be neglected. So this focus point becomes your principal point. And say I'll show it again. I'll show you the fiducial marks. Fiducial marks is the exact center of each sides. As I told you already, so there are four corners. So these are the four corners: one, two, three, four corners, and a left side mark, right side mark, top mark, and bottom mark. Okay. So all these are called as fiducial marks on the plane. Then join all them from top to bottom and bottom from the top to bottom and the left to right. So they meet at some point. So that point is your principal point 
So next is your types of aerial photograph. So an aerial photograph mission will be flown in steps. Shattering time set for 60% end lap. So needed for parallax and steps placed for 30% side laps. To avoid the missing of bits or information. Sixty percent overlapping will be given for uh, shuttering, such that they take uh, sixty percentage of exact information. So, you can see a focal length. So, twelve cross twenty-four inch focal length, a six-inch focal length, which is used to take photographs of particular region. So, plus an additional of twenty-five percentage overlapping will be given. So this shows strip one, strip two. So end lap will be there. So when the flight is moving, they will on it. So after in time sequences, it will take photographs accordingly. So which one gives us the more illustration, more high resolution will be recorded. Okay. So the end lap or the four lap is important bit that ensures every point on the ground appears in at least two photographs. Okay, two at least two photographs. So the distance between the principal point of adjacent photographs is known as air base. First photograph and the second photograph is taken, and the distance between them is being measured as air bases. So next concept is photogrammetry. So always we call this as aerial photogrammetry. Why? Because these are being taken from aerial. Most probably the pigeons or the aircrafts will take photo from higher altitude. Altitude. You can see that we have the same camera that we had shown in the previous. A, B, C, D is used. The principal point is at the center. We have the camera at top. So the point Y is the place we want to find, and uh, this red color <coughs> line is the focal length of camera. The blue color line is the height of the aircraft above the ground level. So with this we can calculate the focal length. If focal length is known, height of the camera is known. We can calculate the scale of photograph, photogrammetry. So as already discussed, the same photogrammetry scale f by h minus h. This photogrammetry is, was designed for a two-dimensional and we extended to three-dimensional also, which we are using nowadays in 3D, 3D structuring. Okay. But to make a three-dimensional, you need to learn more. So still we are learning in 2D only, so learning of 3D will take more, some more time. So this is another history of aerial photograph, you can see. San Francisco in ruin was taken by George Lawrence with a kite six weeks after the great 1906 earthquake. 
as I shown in the beginning itself. George Lawrence took San Francisco. So how it looked at that time was like this earthquake. After the earthquake, the San Francisco was this flooded with water. These are the boats or ships. These are the building structures, buildings, or places. In a kite view. Yes, so uh, when cut Raj, any doubt, any queries, you have raised your hand. So moving on to the further, the history of aerial photography stands where in 1909, Wilbur Wright and a motion picture photographer were first used as an aircraft to revolve around the city in Centoli in Italy. So the famous World War II. Uh, filmmakers were Kodak, they developed the uh, camp foliage detection film that used yellow filter which are sensitive to red, near infrared and green regions. So this camouflage netting took photographs developed by Kodak during World War II. Tanks painted green were uh, shown upon us shown as a blue instead of red like surrounding vegetation okay so they used some principles so this production films were sensitive to green red nir okay so green was detected red was detected nir was detected but whereas blue were detected as red sorry a blue which was not detectable by the camouflage detection flames were drawn as green. Okay. So this is aerial photography, you can see. 2002. In year 2002, field workers document the effects of M79 Denali fault earthquake with digital cameras from planes and helicopters. They are taken. They taken it. So mosaic view of rock avalanches across Black Rapids Glacier, photo by Dennis Robent, mosaic by Rod March, U.S. Geodetical Survey, United States. So then, in the right hand side, we have an aerial view of the Trans Alaska Pipeline and Richardson Highway. So right hand side is your Richardson Highway. Left side is the Trans Alaska pipeline, which is supplying water. So, along the fault resulted in displacement of the highway. So, photo by Patty Gravan. So, next is an uh, Photograph. It's a digital photograph. Okay. Okay. A Phil Cochrane Carker School students take digital photographs at Twin Bears Camp, Alaska. Okay. In an aerial view. See that it's an aerial view. So this is their camp. This is the camp. This is the shed. Okay. 
they are flying a balloon see here you see a balloon in orange color in the left hand left hand left hand picture you see a balloon in the top so from that balloon they are taken photograph okay so a person at the other end of the lake had taken that photograph and what this balloon had taken this balloon is being recorded here in the larger picture you can see you can see the larger picture in this larger picture so the balloon flew away flew at the top and uh, the these are the children those was those were at the camp twin years camp they themselves the shed the vehicle and their hut and this path and uh, when that raised the balloon to the top aerial so this is your aerial photography okay, in 2006 so next uh, types of air photos so in the year uh, september 8 1961 the high oblique photo by Austin Post. He had taken the bad glacier photograph from aerially. This was the view. Okay, so where it had shown high and low and oblique. You can see this is an example of your high oblique photos. Next is the vertical or stereo 3D taken by the CIR films. Same Alaska area. Alaska area or the Alaska. This time we are going to see the Galbraith Lake or the Galbraith water body. Okay. So you can see at the top you have one, two, three, four. These are the moving aircrafts. That had taken the flames at uh, shot one, shot two, shot three, shot four. The aircraft is moving and is coming back to take photographs. So, recording at one, two, three, four is being covered with at least 60 percentage. So, on that, when we are done, so this picture up here, you can see left side. So, this is the picture taken at the first, and this is the next, and it goes on. So, which had given higher resolution is being put up here. Okay, you can see that these are the glaciers. The stereo path which was being taken so these are the mountains here in between there is some vegetation or there are some uh, non bushy structures then the blue indicates your uh, blue color indicates your water body water lake which is present This is how we use a stereographic to view a color infrared stereo place in the field. So this is how. A large format of oblique camera as an example of aerial cameras. You can see a lady taking a photograph using a oblique camera. So you can see here, this same camera is fitted here. For taking photographs, Keystone's Wild RC10 mapping for camera in an aircraft. So next is the film types we had seen. So black and white infrared, which are popular flood flood mapping. So depending upon the application, they had used different types of uh, films. So if you want to uh, if you want to measure the flood mapping as we had seen in uh, uh, San Francisco San Francisco earthquake mapping earthquake photograph taken so the, they had used black and white infrared so where this black and white infrared is more popular for flood mapping where water appears very dark when it can be used for vegetation mapping also where most of the vegetation will appear very likely so that can be 
mapped easily. So soils dry versus moist can be easily measured. And so whereas the false color infrared CAR having standard false color can be done for vegetation studies and water turbidity. Movement of the water can be easily printed by, by this type of flame. You can see an example of a true color versus a CIR. CIR how the same the same location when taken in CIR, how it looks when it is taken in true color flame, how it looks. You can see there is a huge difference. So whatever appears in uh, red is appearing in green in true. So which means there are vegetation there. Whatever appears here in uh, white is appearing gray here, which means there are mountains. Examples. So the printing, as already said, the products used for them are your uh, nine cross nine, flim positives, mosaic types, indices, which are used as a reference for aerial photo locations, then rectified photos, which can import into a GIS, geographic information system. Then we, we can use either ortho rectified photos that can be imported into a GIS again, and we can go for digital ortho photos that can also be imported into a geographic information system. So this geographic information system will be studying in unit four in depth. So need not worry about them. So a printed information or annotation such that we can see the area. Okay. So what are the things we need to find out is that we need to make a note of the date of flight, time, beginning of flight, end of flight line. Then we need to see the camera focal length measured in millimeter. Frequently we'll be using uh, 152.598 millimeter, which is approximately six inches. Okay. The nominal scale use always RF. So depending upon the vendor or the required service, or depending upon the role or the flight line and exposure, the printing information should be taken into consideration. Why the date of flight is considered is that the climatic conditions in the geographical system. For example, I'll give you an example is that, so in India, now the date is, uh, I think, 8-1-2021. Uh, it's 8-1-2021 is very much colder part in most of the parts of India. So whereas when you go to Australia, it is the summer season. So very much hot season you can find in Australia. When you move from region to region, so that will differ. So that determines the geographical condition. So the date of flight plays a major role. So next, uh, determining photo scale. Sometimes at the beginning and end of the flight time, the nominal scale is printed at the top of your photo, usually called as RF. Usually we call it as RF. So determining photo scale. In what range the flight is flying and at what range the photo is being taken. Such that we can easily determine the scale. So the determining scale is, we have to compute the scale using a ruler, a map, calculator, and this formula. RF is 1 divided by MD, MS by PD. MD is the distance measured on a map with a ruler, measured in inches or centimeter. Whereas MS is the map scale denominator, usually used uh, uh, as an example is 24,000 for United States Geodetical Survey, map scale denominator. Then PD is the photo distance measured in same units as 
map distance photo distance so from this we can find this cable so if we can roughly estimate the scale from a cultural futures if there are any image as in the problematic in alaska example tracks and athletic fields i have shown you and a color and then a car so that is your is the problem so the problem in the alaska stretch i'll show you right so that can be easily found out you can estimate the scales also okay to show you the alaska photographs taken by two different areas so, yeah this is what so from this we can roughly estimate the values so this is alaska alaska's athletic field taken on two different photographs color photograph and car photograph athletic can see here this is your athletic field So next is determining photo orientation. So labels and annotation are almost along the northern edge of photo. You can see that this is a highway which is present in an air force or an aerodrome. Okay. Sometimes eastern edge is used. Only way to solve all these issues, labeling and annotation is. using a map next uh, is how to interpret a photo okay so always the photos that are being taken in any part should be uh, recognized so the recognizing elements are shape shape in each either it could be circular you can see a circular circular shape rectangular triangular diagonal whatever might be you can see the shapes then size one could be smaller one could be larger one could be medium and it depend on it depends so size then color or tone you can see here i had given gray this is gray this is whitish this is brown this is orange this is red and it goes on okay the color or tone then the texture in which variation it differs so these are the four main recognition pack recognition elements and in addition to that we have pattern okay, you can see that in this circle for example in the shape of circle here we have a pattern like this the center this line is towards this side here the line is towards that side so that is your pattern then site which geographical location site it is being taken then association and shadow so all are having orange here orange or reddish whereas here this oranges so this defines your recognition association and shadows so this eight uh, lays as a basic photo interpretation of recognizing picture elements taken from a photograph so i'll show you an example so in this previous page you couldn't get what is this left side diagram is okay left side picture so this left side picture is the pentagon i think most probably everyone are familiar with pentagon right okay those so the shape cultural features geometric distinct boundaries natural features such as irregular shapes and boundaries shapes helps us in distinguishing old versus new subdivisions some tree species athletic fields etc can be easily monitored you can see that in alaska mentoring river flows in this direction so this is an example of irregular shape so which is a natural rather than going in a straight like this it goes in this fashion because it is its natural future we cannot change it okay so it takes right hand side takes left 
takes a left again it takes a right then goes on it takes a right takes a left goes on it goes on this is your mentoring river in alaska which is a natural future irregular shape and boundaries so this shape has to be monitored okay so this shape is maintained over a period or not is to be checked out so this is your regular shape okay you can see the cultural features like geometric and distinct bodies you can see the pentagon pentagon in united states you can see this pentagon shape of a building okay then we have the interior alaskan village okay you can see an uh, air strip near top of the image okay you can see that air strip here okay so this this is how to classify shapes next size so size is relatively an important clue as to find what it is you can see a big water river versus a small river you can see this is a big water river where water is flowing you can see a small river or slow or connecting which connects this river so this is size so then we can uh, compare it with houses and apartments also and the buildings and small buildings can be comparatively compared you can see here these are larger buildings these are larger buildings here these are smaller buildings so these are apartments easily classifying them it as apartments and easily can classify these as small houses depending upon the size so you can see that single lane road versus multi lane road you can see this is a highway here cars are moving these are larger roads multi lanes multi lanes and these are small streets which are whitish so these these are small lanes small buildings okay so this recognizes that here in this geographical part here larger buildings are there here smaller houses are there next is the color tone okay this color tone can be uh, <clears throat> measured for using uh, vegetation most probably okay for example i'll show you <clears throat> an example of this spruce forest black with some dedicious red trees you can see in this see a spruce forest coniferous was deciduous okay so if you see in the leafy vegetation the same place will look like this okay you can see that how they are looking in red vegetation red color is a vegetation so in car mixed spruce and delicious forest on hillside with a tundra valley region so this is a tundra valley region how it looks so valley is a point like this so tundra region will look like this so depending upon the coniferous trees or the deciduous trees the color or tone will vary but all are vegetation can see an example the relative clear chenna river water chenna will look like this so the color or tone the turbidity relative amounts of sediment water will look in photographic like this taken by maria stolo okay then the vegetation presence or absence taken on this place will be looking like this okay you can see that this diagram is same as we had seen here in this size so in this size when we take a photograph this chenna river water is looking like this so the big light blue river in the lower part of the image is the tana river it carries fine particles eroded by glaciers in the alaska region okay so the smaller dark blue river flows from south from top of the image to the tana river so it is fed by surface run of and ground water sources does not carry much sediment okay so the unvegetated gravel bars gravel bars look bright bluish white so this this whitish color is your gravel bars okay. so this color 
this color tone determines what type of water in the water itself how much amount of uh, uh, gravel or sediments or uh, water is being flowing okay depending upon its color you can see again the texture of the same region that we are taking in a tundra for example we are taking it as tundra the texture the coarseness or smoothness caused by variability or uniformity of image tone or color so whereas smoothness of tundra swamps fields water etc can be measured coarseness of the forest lava flows mountains can be measured you can see the first picture the sea is a color infrared marshy tundra with many small ponds you can see this dark structures like holes like holes you can see that there is a like hole structures here okay small ponds those are small ponds so bare rounded mountains blue surrounded by tundra and lakes you can see this blue color or bare rounded mountains so then the photograph of the tundra showing drainage pattern so drainage pattern is flow of the water its tributaries this is your flow okay next is the pattern which is an important either in uh, flood mapping or in uh, urban planning which defines a special form of related futures the repeating patterns tend to indicate cultural futures random or natural okay uh, drainage patterns uh, can help geologists determine bedrock type okay so a dendritic pattern is characteristic of flat lying sedimentary bedrocks you can see so if the flow of pattern is like this it shows that wherever it takes a curve it shows that there is a bedrock in the opposite so for example i'll show that here this tribute this pattern of drawing of water flowing in the uh, tundra region is moving in this direction here here it goes it goes in a straight and it takes a curve here you can see that there is a curve so this means that exactly opposite to this there is a sedimentary bedrock which diverts this direction or which directs the water to flow in another direction opposite to that so there is a huge bedrock here so this helps geologists to determine bedrock type and its pattern how it is there okay. this is similar to all so then the site the site is the relationship of a future to its environment the differences in vegetation based on location so we are seeing the alaskan river again let us see the alaskan river you can see the alaskan river here it goes in this direction means that here there is a heavy bedrock here when it takes a divergence or in the direction of the flow of water is here it turns so here is a heavy bedrock or a mountain under the water so which diverts the water to go in this direction okay which means in the interior alaska the black spurs dominant on the north side of the hills and deciduous trees on the south side vegetation is often has different characteristics by rivers than away from them okay so nearby the rivers we have more vegetation you can see that you can see from this alaskan river meandering in alaskan river you can see along the river there is on the both the sides we have huge vegetation you can see it goes on but away from there when we take photographs you can see that there is lesser vegetation because the flow of water reaching this points is uh, not that much easier so along the river the vegetation is much more so but this way we can get it get the information so if you see the interior alaskan hill site at this point this is your interior alaskan hill site so there is no vegetation at all so the black spur dominate the north side of the hills shows that it is a deciduous trees then association so association is 
identifying one future can help identify another future so correlation so you can see that there is a white cloud and a black shadow having the same okay so a photo is taken in aerial at a particular point we can see that white cloud is moving so a shadow of that is falling on the earth so that photo is taken so which is of the same shape so identifying the either the black or the white we can identify that there is a cloud is being passing in this place then with the help of one future we can identify the another future so which is we call as correlation or association so you can see that uh, the long straight air strip near the top of the image here you can see that long straight air strip indicates that there might be a village there is a village or a settlement nearby okay settlement is an area where people live okay so along this river so this blue is your river along the, along the glacier or along the uh, river so nearby there is a straight of houses at the top you can see at the top a long straight air strip so, so that resembles there is an settlement or there is a village next uh, shadows shadows cast by some futures that aid in their identification so some three types storage tanks bridges can be identified in this way shadows can uh, accumulate terrain okay you can see an example the mountain ridge on the right hand side of this image right hand side so this is your right hand side okay so right hand side of the image is accumulated by the shadow so the shadow itself will follow the image so that can be acquired so with that we can identify whether it is a bridge or a storage tank or any some other types of trees so i think with this the presentation for a second class of remote sensing is over any queries type in chat box i'll be pleasure to no in olden days we didn't use any matlab at all for uh, who so uh, yeah sai ganesh car is your uh, photo taken as it is recorded and printed color infrared convert into different sense sir in olden days that's what uh, if you want to resolve it we need to study about gis that's what i said uh, gis will be studying in unit 4 in that you will see how acquisition of data is done and uh, how they are being converted okay okay sir. mostly we'll be using uh, yeah mostly we'll be using uh, scanning segments as we do in nowadays by using a scanner at homes or at offices we have uh, two dimensional scanners based upon the picture element will be resolving it into some uh, zeros and ones of amplitude levels of the corresponding picture element then we store it so whereas the digital camera or the cameras which were used earlier didn't had a matlab software with them for converting they take as it is by using the flames for example i had shown you a film called uh, uh, let me show you again the film types of flames okay. yeah Yeah, for example, during the World War Two, they developed uh, camouflage. Sorry, camouflage detection films, which used yellow filters. You can see that used yellow filter, which is sensitive to, to green, red, and NIR, near infrared, red, and green. So where this camouflage netting was done by mapping. 
tanks as green okay instead of blue and vegetation as this color okay so that films were recorded as it is and given for printing no way storage came as you have seen some uh, 20 years back uh, they had used some films to develop uh, photographs same concept so they didn't take any uh, systems they didn't take any monitors they did not take any uh, hardware structures apart from the camera 